So yeah, uh, welcome. I'm going to talk about validating system executions with TLA+. And when I say I, it's a group of people at INRIA and various entities of Microsoft. And the real title of my talk is obviously uh, a homework assignment, an answer to a homework assignment by our keynote speaker this morning. How do we close the spec to code gap? Uh, in the past, I guess I've been one of the people who has been a bit dismissive of this question, um, but then I realized, yeah, uh, we leave a lot of people sort of out there who want to do TLA plus, but for which we don't have a good answer. So the answer is, well, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You have a distributed system, and I will primarily talk about distributed systems here. All of your nodes are logging the local events anyway, right? Each node maintains a log file. It get, gets written somewhere to local storage, fine. And if there's an incident in production, well, then you look at those log files anyway. So in testing, what we do is, let's just collect these log files and combine them into one single global log you know, by some timestamp, by some clock, so that the causal order is maintained um, in the log file. And then <clears throat> in TLA plus, the answer to everything is write another specification. We have a trace specification uh, called trace that reads the log file and creates the set of behaviors T that conform to what you see in the log file. So naively, you might think there's just a single behavior in T. Now this was just a single execution of your system. But perhaps you weren't able to collect all the information of your distributed system, so you had sort of holes in your log file and you had to guess. And then you end up with more than one behavior in T. And the validation part then is, well, you have your beautiful handwritten specification, perhaps reverse engineered from the code, but you compare that, its set of behaviors, to the set of behaviors of uh, trace, and if the intersection is non-empty, well, then luckily this behavior, this execution, was accepted by our high-level specification. Yeah, so you want to do with it, want to be in the intersection part. Um, this idea is new. There was this prior work, actually goes back more than 20 years, uh, when a group around Lamport used TLA plus and then new TLC to verify um, a cache coherence protocol. And they did two things. A, they took behaviors coming out of TLC and replayed those behaviors in a hardware simulator. Now they were doing RTL design, and I have no idea what, what that actually means. But they were able to replay those behaviors in the RTL simulator. And simultaneously, they were also extracting other behaviors or other executions coming out of this hardware simulator and valid validated those against the TLA plus specification. In other words, trace validation. Except perhaps that they did this in a concurrent system, not a distributed one, and the tooling, the TLA plus tooling, was pretty custom tailored to this particular effort. In 2018, Ron Pressler wrote this beautiful little note about this technique in general. Yeah, how can you relate um, implementation level traces to TLA plus specifications, which I believe is fair to say sparked these two papers here. Um, extreme Modeling and Practice out of MongoDB by Jesse Davis et al. and Jordan Haltermann, who independently applied it in, um, in a different system, which is now a product of Intel, I believe. And Jesse et al., they were a little bit less enthusiastic about trace validation. Jordan Haltermann, I think, was a bit more positive. They had experience with two systems. We now, in this work here, have experience with seven additional systems. The first five are actually systems where we did essentially spec-driven development using trace validation. Several years ago, I applied trace validation to the model uh, multi-producer, multi-consumer problem. You have a set of producers, a set of consumers. In the middle, there's a fixed size queue. They communicate through the queue. If the queue is full, producers have to wait. If the uh, queue is empty, consumers have to wait. And if you don't get your synchronization right, specifically if you only use one single mutex, well, then your system and some, conf some configuration can, can deadlock. And uh, the specification shows that you have to use two uh, mutexes, and trace validation instantaneously um, found the discrepancy. Well, that's a concurrent system. 
More recently, I applied it to a distribution, distributed termination detection algorithm, DWD-998, wrote the spec first, and then the implementation. And even though I was intimately familiar with the specification, as a matter of fact, this is my running example in TLA Plus workshops, I still screwed up in the implementation. Yeah? This token, and you will later see what this token actually does, it kept going around the ring long after the initiated attack the termination. Yeah? And that was found with trace validation. And then I thought, ah, that's an easy fix. So I came up with an easy quick fix, which trace validation showed was wrong. So I had to do it again. <clears throat> and at INRIA, they implemented um, a specification by Lampard of 2PC, two-phase commit. And the implementation had a bug that it used a list data structure instead of a set data structure. So now if a resource manager would time out while the transaction manager is waiting for all the resource managers to answer, and then the resource manager would subsequently re-signal that it's ready, it would be counted twice. Yeah? And then the transaction manager could just declare global commit. In a key value store specification due to Murad here, also implemented by in, at INRIA, they had a bug in how they initially initialized the local snapshot at the beginning of a transaction, again found by trace validation. And last but not least, an implementation of vanilla raft based on Diego Ongaru's specification. Um, they made a deliberate mistake to do to wrongly do the, the calculation of the quorum. And in this particular case, due to this broken arithmetic, a candidate could receive a quorum even though it didn't have one, right? And then you went, would end up with multiple leaders in the same term. And all of this was caught by trace validation. But again, spec-driven development and smaller systems, I would say. But we've also been applying it to a bigger system, etcd. I believe it has 44,000 stars on GitHub, so it's reasonable reasonably popular in the internet, might even show up in other tracks here of the conference, has almost 900 contributors, several releases, so it's super mature, and the Microsoft product group wants to bring a new feature to etcd, which is called a witness support. Essentially, you bring down the operational cost of running the cluster, by instead of using three nodes, you only use two nodes plus a witness. And they did spectrum development, so they specified the feature. They even wrote a pen and paper proof, yet to be mechanized with GLabs. And that's convincing to the etcd maintainers that the algorithm works. But how, they wondered, how do we make sure that also the implementation of this new witness feature is correct? And so we decided, hey, first we will add trace validation to etcd, yeah, to vanilla etcd, as it is right now. That's currently being tracked in 1.11 and it's nearing completion. And then in 1.33, uh, the Raft witness support will be added to, uh, to etcd, based then also on the trace validation. And one of the uh, maintainers here, Theresio, thinks that trace validation and TLC model checking is sort of vital. Also along the way, we didn't find a safety bug in etcd with trace validation, unfortunately, dang. But we found at least an inefficiency. Yeah? So if the database of some of the nodes has to be um, resynced, so you have to lose or drop a suffix of the database at one node, and it has to resync with the other nodes, the node would go back too far, yeah? and you would waste cycles to sync it back up again. And that was found by, the, by, by trace validation. Interesting little anecdote here. Um, Siang90, who is, I believe, one of the founding members of etcd, apparently spoke with Lamport and Ju in 2015 about ways to generate an implementation from a specification. And Lamport and Ju were like, yeah, there have been a few of efforts, but they weren't super successful. And I'm pretty sure that Finn over there has a different opinion. He will talk about it after me, so I will leave that for him. But what um, Lampard and Juice suggested was, hey, look, how about you write a mapping function that takes the implementation state and compares that to the specification state, yeah, aka trace validation. So here, some eight years later, we finally brought trace validation to etcd. And uh, sort of the last experience report in my uh, 
talk today here is the Confidential Consortium Framework, CCF, done by Azure Research. It's Raft inspired, it's not vanilla Raft, um, it's Raft inspired, crash fault tolerant consensus. It has dynamic reconfiguration. We learned all about dynamic reconfiguration this morning and how hard it is. It also has cryptographic guarantees built into the consensus uh, layer. And it is the off uh, foundation of some Azure offerings. It's perhaps not as mature as uh, at CD, but still reasonably mature. It has several releases, yeah, foundational offering um, in Azure. And it's written in a highly efficient programming language here that everybody loves. <coughs> Since 2019, um, or after 2019, actually around 2022, the team decided, okay, we have an implementation. Now we also want a specification. I can only speculate about the reasons, and I won't do that. But somebody was tasked to write a specification, and they essentially followed Kelvin's outline here, reverse engineer the source code, talk to engineers, spend several months yeah, figuring out what the system actually does. And they model checked that specification. They found issues, subsequently corrected. And then in 2023, we thought, hmm, perhaps we can do more. Let's try trace validation, yeah? They happen to have a testing environment, yeah, some shim, some test driver, to run multiple nodes on a single computer and have them do things. So we took those 15 or so tests they had and obtained the traces, the executions coming out of the tests, to bring the spec up to speed, to update it. And that was a great process. Initially, we found low-hanging things like, okay, in a specification, you can only ever send an append entries message with a single entry, but the implementation may send empty or zero entry entries or batches of entries. It's okay to abstract it this way. On the other hand, if you think of batches, those entries might be from different terms, and suddenly your correctness might be a little bit different. Yeah. We added more and more changes to the high-level specification because we knew, knew it wasn't like up-to-date. And you can go on GitHub and look at the 20 or so pull requests. We got a bit more ambitious later on um, in the sense that we added the bootstrapping of nodes to the specification of how the bootstrapping is done in the real system, how the node membership works related to the cryptographic guarantees, and also how node retirement works and how long nodes have to stay around in order for the system to remain live. And then we felt pretty, pretty good about our specification so that we decided now it's time to also do new features based on the specification. So we sort of reversed from going backwards to forwards and started to add request, propose request vote messages to the high level specification. And once we found this work works we implemented it um, in the code. <clears throat> Later on, we also experimented with different network guarantees at the spec level to see what kind of message channels the act implementation actually needs, what kind of guarantees it needs. Does it need order delivery, or can we get away without order delivery? We looked at those kinds of questions. But most surprisingly, we found two data loss issues um, doing trace validation. So one was because we reuse, or CCF reuses the term field in append entries messages, and then due to some unlucky reordering of append entries of stale append entries messages and negative append entries message, yeah, in other words, some non-happy path, the system could lose data, the commit index could be advanced past the quorum, um, and then if a node uh, crashes, data is lost. The other one, the second one was similar, a node locally reused its match index variable, and that could also lead to unsafely advancing the commit index. And again, some non-happy path behavior. But now the big question obviously is, how is it possible that trace validation, yeah, that we did starting from passing tests, we started with passing tests, those were green, those tests didn't lose data, and they obviously assured that the network doesn't lose data, or that the system doesn't lose data. Well, obviously, if you do trace validation, you don't do it in isolation. Instead, it's one more tool in your 
TLA plus engineering verification tool bed. You start with a trace that fails and then iteratively you update this high level specification. Or you find, hey, I will leave the specification a bit more abstract, but in my trace specification, I will formally document this divergence and I will show you what that actually means later. And then at some point later, you're at the point that your traces all validate, yeah? And that's great, but it, you don't stop. You keep going and now do full-scale verification. And that's when we found that, oh, TLC suddenly finds the violations of the core correctness properties of our specification. Hmm. So this could have been a spec bug. Yeah? Just because we find an issue at the level of the specification doesn't necessarily mean that the implementation is also vulnerable. So we manually translated TLC's counterexample into a new test or into new tests, multiple tests, with which we confirm that the bugs are present also in the implementation. Now, bugs are great to show that, uh, sorry, tests are great to show that bugs are present. Not so much that there are no bugs, right? Luckily, TLA plus counterexamples are typically relatively short, so this exercise wasn't super hard, but it would be nice to do this in an automated fashion, and that's going to resurface in our uh, in the future work section of this presentation here. Okay, knowing that the implementation was vulnerable, we then obviously came up with a fix at the level of the specification. Uh, again, did a hell of a model checking, simulation and everything. Ideally, you could also do a theorem proving at this point again before we rolled the fix in the implementation. Okay, questions so far? Like you're doing like like 10,000 requests a second or staying up for like a couple weeks or something like that. How do you test something like that with TLA where you need like a huge load or? No, no, we, we okay. don't need a huge load in TLA plus. So A, your specification is highly abstract and removes a lot of the detail that is irrelevant to finding these issues. And like Kelvin said, by default, everything in TLA plus is sort of concurrent and the model checker will check all the possible combinations of these actions. It sort of finds these things. And you use the small scope hypothesis. You don't test this with 40 nodes, but with three or five nodes, and then those bugs become more likely. Okay, so I keep going. Because now it's time for the trace validation mini tutorial based on EWD 998. This is really just an excerpt. If you want to see the, the long version, go to this pull request where I try to summarize uh, everything as best as possible in various commits. So in order to do trace validation, you have to understand what the actual system is. And it's this termination detection um, algorithm. Yeah, Zach and uh, other folks here in the audience are experts in this system now. It's pretty easy. You have a distributed system and they carry out some computation. That involves sending messages back and forth. So you send a message from node A to node B and node B receives the message. And then sometime later, if nodes run out of work, they decide to deactivate, yeah, go idle until they receive another message. Yeah. And now detecting termination here seems easy. You just look at all the nodes are deactivated, but if you don't have a control plane, like in a cloud en environment, you somehow have to do this inside of a distributed system. And that's where our token passing kicks in. Yeah, we have some node who passes a token around a ring, a, topologic, a logical topology of our nodes. And after multiple rounds of this token passing, the initiator can infer based on the state of the token that the system has terminated. Yeah, I'm glossing over lots and lots of detail here, obviously, and I don't expect you to fully grok the algorithm. The main takeaway is we have three actions, send, receive, and deactivate, and they model asynchronous message delivery. And we have two other action, initiate token and pass token, that model the synchronous or atomic token passing in our high-level specification. Okay, in pictures, 
the ex an execution of the system may look like this. Now we have six nodes here, some of which are active, some are inactive. They send messages back and forth. And this green thing that starts traveling around the ring now is our token. And the RDRSDR is the local system log. Yeah? It's sort of the event of actions that happen at each one of the nodes. Okay, now you know how this how the system approximately looks like. When and where do I log in the implementation? Where, when and where do I keep system state? <clears throat> I do this in only two places. When a node, send, node sends a message and when a node receives a message. And for no real reason, I choose to use JSON as my wire and log uh, format. Could have been any format, right? But when a node sends a message, it writes it to the socket, and since it's already serialized, I might as well write it to S3 out into my fancy logging library and receive messages similar. So then, what does this ominous trace specification look like that reads the log file into TLA plus behaviors? This is it. Yeah. It only contains, the real one is a bit longer, I will show it afterwards. We extend the original specification because there are so many useful definitions that we just want to reuse in our low-level specification. We also uh, extend JSON and backdoc log because they have useful definitions to order and read our log files. And then the only other variable that this specification declares is the length variable, which is our offset into the log. Yeah? How many lines of the log have we already processed? And then we have five actions. Here's only one, is send message that essentially checks if there are still more log lines to be consumed. Yeah? If length is in the domain of the log, well, bump length and check if the event in the log is a send event. If it's a send event and the message that was sent, its type is a payload PL message, well, then we know this has to be a send message action of the high-level specification, EWD998 Chen. And the argument to that is the identity of our sender node. And the angel send message subvars makes sure that the variables of the high-level specification actually change. And then the last line, it's technically not strictly necessary, but I happen to define send message in the high level specification in the typical TLA plus fashion. In other words, I used existential quantification to select the receiver node. Yeah, send message is defined. There exists a node in the set of all nodes such, it, such that its inbox in the next state contains one more message. And with a system of, say, six nodes, we would have six successor states for the current state, current state uh, for a send message action. But clearly, we can do better. We can prune away five of those six states to limit state space explosion and have this constraint down here do that. No? That's it. So let's see. Ah, this is what I wrote about. Okay. Ah, this is way too small, but I can make it bigger. Now I only have to find mouse. So here's our, no, this is pass token. Uh, is this a send message? Yeah. So this is send message, the one we had on the slide. Well, okay. Well, you see the five actions here, and they all look pretty much the same. Maybe I have to move around here. Uh, send messages up here. But it's the same pattern or repeated all over, right? So let's see if we can now validate a trace that I previously recorded. And TLC says, oh, no, sorry, no can do this. Trace doesn't validate. Dang. So what's the problem here? This is so the problem is that our log file, because we only log send and receive events, only contains the line that says node number two passes the token to node number one. 
then the token is in transit on the wire. We have no control over the wire. And sometime later, there's a log line that says node number one receives this token from node number two. Asynchronous message delivery, yeah? But in our specification, token passing is atomic. It arrives at the destination in a single step. Yeah? So there's a mismatch here in terms of the alignment of the behaviors. But TLA plus has us covered. We just add a stuttering step into our um, trace behavior here. By adding a definition called is received token, which you can see doesn't change any of the variables. If we go back to our specification, and if I find my pointer, it's this guy here, and it says unchanged variables. Yeah? It, does, it leaves the high level um, variables unchanged. It just allows us to introduce a stuttering step. We could have also pre-processed the log and eliminate those log lines, but I think that's ugly. I don't like that. <coughs> okay. So let's add that conjunct. Oop, oh, sorry. To our specification and check again. And still, we, we don't manage to uh, validate the trace, but I think we made progress. We now are at step number five. Now we've moved from two to five. Yay. And now I have to do this again. And the problem here is, okay, previously we had to do, had to introduce a stuttering step, but now a node is only allowed to send a token if it's inactive. But nowhere do we lock that node's deactivate. That's also not in our lock. Yeah? This is the, one of the holes that I had mentioned earlier. And in order to account for this, we have to allow nodes to non-deterministically go to inactive while they pass a token. And this is done by composing the high-level action deactivate with the high-level action pass token with the action composition operator that has recently been added to TLC, or support of which has recently been implemented in TLC. So we see there exists an I node such that I deactivates C dot pass token. Uh, it does this in one step. And now if I check this new specification, it passes. Um, great. <coughs> so let's go back to here. But what is it we actually verify? when we do trace validation. We do the intersection, right? But TLC only has invariants and properties, at least historically, yeah? safety and liveness properties. This isn't a safety property. What should be the safety property? This is not a state level formula that we can check here. You might be tempted to check deadlock, but I don't know, I guess I went too, too fast. The diameter in model checking was something like 150, but the number of distinct states was 156 or so. Because there were a few states in the state graph that, uh, due to non-determinism, which would violate our deadlock check. So we would see spurious counterexamples because these states don't have successor states. And for the same reason, we can't use a liveness property like eventually always the length of the log is equal to the length, or the length variable is equal to the length of the log would also produce a spurious counterexample. What we really want to check is a CTL property. There exists a path in the set of all behaviors such that the length variable is equal to the length of the log, but we can't express that in TLA plus. The next best workaround, if you want something like a counterexample, is this liveness here that's a bit convoluted that I had to abbreviate to fit on the slide, which essentially says, for as long as we are not at the point where length is equal to the length of the log, TLC still has unexplored, success, unexplored states in its state queue. Uh, it's very technical, very messy, but you get some candidate behavior as a counterexample. But the real property that you want to check 
because as I will argue in a minute, there are no counterexamples here. The real property to check is that the longest behavior that TLC generated, the diameter is equal to the length of the log. That says there exists a, pa a behavior in the set of all the behaviors whose length is the length of the log. And then a violation to um, trace validation would be a graph that looks like, where can I find this? That trace, trace. That looks like this here. <laughs> and if you scroll in, there are many points. Obviously, you want to do this on a bigger computer. Um, screen, rather. Um, <clears throat> you see TLC finds all these alternatives, and some of which have been excluded. Those are the yellow states. They have been excluded due to our last conjunct and sent message. But perhaps those will be the real states, the real path to fully match the log. And that's why I argue you always have to look at the graph rather than individual counterexamples because those bad counterexamples might be a red herring. And by the way, the TLA plus debugger can help you figure out where the validation fails because you can set a dedicated uh, breakpoint and then it will hold the moment, the debugger will hold the moment it starts rejecting uh, states. Okay, so in the two raft-based systems, how much logging did we have to add? In the case of etcd, we added logging in 11 places. And in CCF, we did so in 15 places. And it's really essentially STD out. Yeah, there is no convoluted logging library that we make you buy into. We also don't require some deterministic hypervisor. It's really your system running in your environment, just logging. Yeah, we log when messages are sent and received. Because CCF is written in C++, there are multiple places where messages are sent and received. That's why there's this difference in number of log places. Plus, we also decided that we log in our testing infrastructure when it deliberately loses a message. We could have gone without, but we found that the non-determinism that we had to introduce in the trace specification brought the verification validation time up from seconds to a few minutes. So we decided, okay, we will log this instead to yeah, really make uh, model checking or trace validation super fast. In general, log when messages are sent and received. Yeah, you won't have issues with inadvertent, accidentally deadlocking your system because when you, after things have been serialized, before they get deserialized back into your system, there are no locks anymore that can go, could go into your way. And then ideally, on additionally also log any observable node local state changes. The Nodes going inactive in my EWD998 example, I could have also uh, locked to STD out, right? I just decided for the purpose of this mini tutorial here to not do that. Also include primed and the unprimed variables to strengthen your matching and try to well, only lock constant size variables. That don't lock the content of your Database. You don't want it every state, right? The database to STD out. That wouldn't be feasible, right? Uh, goes without saying. In order to synchronize your clocks, uh, sorry, synchronize or order, causally order your log files, you can use a centralized clock if you have to. I find it way more elegant to use a logical, a distributed clock, like a vector clock, a Lamport clock. Um, perhaps space is prohibitive because you have so many nodes, then use a Lamport clock. I would even argue you want this distributed clock even if you don't do trace validation to just make sense of your log files, right? 
If you want to do vector clocks, we have a vector clock module in the community modules. It has a Java module override to make things fast. We stole the code from the Shivas project to sort the vector clocks. And as a bonus, if you have vector clocks, you can use Ivan's beautiful uh, Shivas tool to visualize the nodes of your system and how they communicate. Yeah? You sort of get that for free. Don't have time for a demo, but it's great. And I'm pretty sure Ivan is willing to give you a demo if you want to. So to wrap up, I hope to have convinced you that the TLA plus tools are mature enough to narrow the spectral code gap. Yeah, I hope you get a, an A from Mark for our homework here. Because, yep, as you've seen, trace validation found spectral code divergences in all seven systems. We found non-trivial uh, bugs in real-world systems. It was also beautiful to reverse engineer CCF. You know, updating the specification based on a trace, uh, perhaps beautiful is too, too optimistic. I was staring at this one debugger and this other debugger and trying to compare values. Perhaps not beautiful. But it was at least better than just uh, throwing arrows in the dark. And more importantly, from now on forward, CICD runs this trace validation on every commit. So if some non-TLA plus engineer changes CCF in a way that breaks the specification, we will likely find it. Clearly, this stuff requires TLA plus expertise. But if you don't have a high level specification, or if you don't have a TLA plus expert, you don't have a TLA plus high level specification, right? So trace validation kind of becomes a mood anyway. And I'm kind of proud that this most recent pull request, 6119, that was opened last week, was opened by an engineer. He's pretty clever, but he only had two days of TLA plus training. And this pull request brings trace validation to another specification in CCF. Okay, what's next? Well, does trace validation generalize? I think we now have nine or so systems where it had provided value. One thing that you could argue is, well, most of them were raft, and more importantly, the raft specification is super low level from the perspective of TLA+. Yeah? If you look at the PEXA specification, it's way more high level, and one might wonder if you would still find so many issues with a more high level specification. But at least in the case of raft, it works. And in TLA+, you can always refine specifications, even if you start with a high level spec, to gradually refine it to bring it closer to the implementation and then do trace validation. We haven't really done this at scale yet, aka production. That's something to be done. And in order to handle this case with the, uh, the drop messages, we implemented a true depth first search mode in TLC that uh, made things significantly faster. Because if you think about it, if you only check the intersection, it suffices to find one behavior in the intersection. Then you can stop. You don't have to exhaustively change, search the state space. What's missing here is sort of the companion of um, trace validation, which I would say call like something like model-based testing that helps you generate diverse sets of behaviors. Yeah? And ideally, <coughs> It would also be able to take counterexamples and translate those into system tests so that you don't have to do this manual translation if the high-level verification finds that there is something off. Alternatively, you can obviously try fuzzing or chaos engineering to penetrate the dark corners of your implementation state space. And with trace validation, you at least have a notion of coverage now yeah, because you can look at the spec coverage. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions? Uh, it was interesting to see seven out of seven there. Um, so uh, kind of to Mark's point earlier, this is starting to feel like something where it's as important to do in terms of rather we're saying, hey, it's really important to do the spec, but hand wave, hand wave, not so important to, yeah, it's gonna translate easily. So where's your, where's your feeling on that of import level of importance after seeing, again, seven out of seven? Yeah, I think I'm surprised how effective it is. 
um, return of return on invest here seems to be pretty high. Um, CCF, I believe I worked a couple of months on it, but majority of the time was spent on updating the TLA plus queries. Um, if, an, if a system expert would have written the trace specification, it would have been faster. I sort of had to understand the system also. Thanks for a great talk, Marcus. I was wondering about, you know, like you've described your validation. It's, it's I, essentially, I see it as a one-time cost effort for trying to map like a specific system to a specific model. But then there's also these like more general funny language tools like Pigo and things that people have been working on that are trying to basically raise the level of, or you know, decrease the level of abstraction, if you will, on the model side and have a kind of a more mechanized mechanized path to implementation. Mm -hmm. and I was just wondering about the, the trade-offs between these, and maybe you could speak to, you know, like when is trace, yeah, just maybe maybe more abstractly about, about trace validation and maybe pros and cons as compared to that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a great idea to generate the implementation from the specification if that works, but I think a current constraint of that is that it has to be a greenfield project and this was always sort of brownfield. Yeah, you have an existing implementation, and I think that's where trace validation sort of has the biggest return on invest. Um, yeah, greenfield, I would probably try to do something like P go first, generate as much as possible, be principled in the way how I implement the system if I have to manually do it, and then would probably get me, yeah, would feel better about the implementation <laughs> if I would apply that technique. Additional questions? I mean, you often like that. Do get out. <laughs> okay. Hey, so uh, recently the whole thing about like subjecting um, distributed systems to, I guess, sort of chaos engineering and traces and stuff uh, got shaken up with the publication of the antithesis system, I don't know if you've heard of antithesis. Yeah, it, they basically made a fully deterministic virtual machine. Um, MongoDB worked with them and they said it worked really well. Um, and then there's also something kicking around for the past decade with like um, Jepson and stuff, wh which also did something similar. Have you thought about how like, hey, maybe TLA plus could function as like the progenitor of traces or something for either like Jepson or, I mean, I don't think anyone really has access to antithesis yet, but so something I, like that. That would be my, my, uh, my argument about antithesis. Um, but I think generally all of these systems are in these three dots here. Fuzzing, chaos engineering, deterministic hypervisors, all the kinds of testing environments you have. Yeah, it's great that there's now like a product out there. I think this has been, the same ideas has been done multiple times for multiple specific projects and implemented over and over and over again. Um, I still, so from my perspective, TLC, TLA plus still has the beauty of making you think abstractly about the system. Yeah? Like I said, I, has been, I have been dismissive of this question of how do you implement the system? Because to some degree I keep saying yeah, it's easier to implement something if you know that it works. Yeah, and TLA plus, gives you this guarantee that it works before you set out to implement it. And my implementation of EWD-998, I mean, initially I tried to implement EWD-998 without the specification. Oh, I had Dijkstra's paper, I had very little time, I would just implement this. And then for a day, it's like scratching my head how to do this here in an imperative language, and I don't really know how the algorithm works. And I essentially gave up, and then I wrote the spec, and then I still screwed up once, but the implementation was done in three hours and it was to 99% correct. And this is the value of TLA plus, that you know what you implement. And everything else is the icing on the cake. We have one more question. Um, maybe we can have Finn set up well. So um, I was surprised to see several of the specifications were shared memory specifications. So your experience is it doesn't matter that much that the um, specification is message passing. Well, obviously, all the implementations are message passing, but it doesn't matter that much that the specification is uh, um, message passing as long as you can find a good uh, refinement mapping. Between right. So uh, 
if the specification in its way how it what it assumes about message communication deviates from the implementation you have more work in the trace specification but there are ways stuttering and action composition to deal with that perhaps the biggest example where we used uh, the action composition was when where raft piggybacks term updates on top of ordinary messages and that was then always composed into one single message update term c dot or the receive actions great talk and one more thing about uh, deterministic simulators i think uh, marcus already mentioned from the spec you can generate tests and using the deterministic simulators uh, subject the implementation to the same test uh, in a basically automated way and i think that's a great opportunity let's get a, give another hand for marcus thank you for your talk